Hi, ever wonder what it's like to work another profession or live in the underworld? Listen to Unsuspecting Riders give a 10 to 15 minute personal masterclass as I spontaneously interview them as they enter my taxi. I'm your host, Simon Rushton, and this is Taxi Chronicles. Morning, morning, morning. Yes, we're back with another episode, another ride, another story, sorry. This one is going to be interesting because I've got a, a young lady here, a beautiful lady, and she's talking about her experience being adopted. And if you know me, I've been adopted as well. So it's going to be a joint conversation with input about what it's like to be adopted. And um, yeah, we'll just take it from there. So nice to have you here today, Sally. Hello. So you were saying you were, you were adopted at two years old? Yeah. I was adopted at five, no, I was actually officially adopted from seven, seven and a half. Okay. But I was fostered before that. Mm. But you tell your story. So when I was, before I was born, my parents had my brother and throughout his first couple of years of life, they Your had... Birth parents, yeah? Yeah, yeah, my birth parents. They had social services involved because it was like an abusive relationship between them so at a young age my brother was put into care and then I was born 10 months later and I was put into a family housing unit and the social workers said to my my birth parents okay you have three months here with your newborn and if it doesn't work out then we'll take her but you know if you do well then you can keep her so they agreed to it and we was put in a family housing unit and within two and a half weeks I was taken away from them because it was evident that they just weren't capable of looking after children were they young parents um relatively young yeah they was like 23 and 24 oh, so they were yeah, yeah they were very yeah. young yeah but yeah you know they, they they say that the decision making part of the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25 yeah so in essence you could argue they're still ju- no, I'm not sure you say juveniles but yeah they weren't fully functional let's say. yeah and that goes for us all let's not yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. Like, I, I'm planning on not having children for a good 10 years. <laughs> like, because I know, like, I want to do everything in life that I want to do and I want to live my life and I want to be fully able and fully capable of looking after myself, let alone one, two, three, four, five children. Because you never know how many you're going to have, but I want to be able to be completely stable within myself before I bring another life into the world. So you were saying about so your parents were were having issues and they decided after three months or after two weeks so yeah. that you were going to go, did you go to children's home? Or so I was going to go into care, but my dad my birth dad's mum said no 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 no. I don't want her in care I'll take her I'll adopt her so they said to her okay because you're elderly we'll give you a three month trial and within two months she turned around and she said look you know this is a newborn baby I'm not capable of looking after her anymore it's just too much so then they put me into the same care home as my brother and from there within a month we was both put into the same foster home and a few months later or just under a year later we was both adopted Together. yeah luckily it was nice that they put you together. Yeah. You know, before they separated, and I've never understood that. Yeah. No, I, I don't understand that at all. I was separated from my sister, uh, even though my sister's two years younger than me, and um, 
I didn't. I never knew I had a sister until I actually was um, taken into foster care at five. And my adopted parents decided that they um, when they, they they took my sister, they wanted a, uh, a boy as well. Yeah. And then they so happened that you know I was I was around, so they searched. They asked the social services, and then they said, "Yeah, we're finding in the system." Uh, it's like your cattle, really. Yeah, it is. But, but then I always think of it, it's like cattle. So I remember being on the, the children's home and there's a big, like a massive picture frame. And you've just got faces of kids in there. Yeah. Big, because those days, obviously, I'm a bit older than you. Uh, mm. And <laughs> the, you, it was like, there's about, like a class of children living yeah. in one house. There's like, like a good 30 plus of us in this one house. And the room I was in was like loads of bunk beds um, and um, sometimes you could share bunk beds with another child if you're small like obviously so I was one of the youngest and things like that but I always saw it as a market yeah because parents their potential parents would come and look at the pictures and that is yeah, sad and was the old, older ones wouldn't get to look in yeah so there if you if you hit a certain age just then it's almost inevitable yeah. that you're gonna stay in the care system. Yeah, until you're a certain age. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so go on. You were saying you spoke about. So you, then you got adopted by both your parents. Yeah. Then I got adopted. Um, me and my brother got adopted by both of our parents, and we lived with them for together. Together, we lived with them for six and a half, seven years, and then my dad had an affair. So they sep both my parents separated, and me and my brother were between both parents for a long time. But we moved from location to location to location with them, and in the end, like now in the end, it turned out that I don't speak to my dad, I don't see my dad, I don't know him. What about your mum? He, he lives with him. Your mum? My mum? Yeah, your, your adopted mum, what about her? She lives with her boyfriend in oh. very far away. Very far away. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and your brother, what's he doing? He lives with our dad. Okay. Uh, I, I remember when I was younger, I always looked at it like I'm going to have my own family and do it right. Yeah, like from from a very, very young age, because my parents like made it very clear that, you know, we're not your parents, but we're here to look after you. We're going to be your new parents and we're going to take care of you from a very young age like it wasn't a shock when I was told okay you're adopted like you know we're not your actual parents but we are your parents so I was never upset shocked scared or angry at that it was just like okay that's fine let me get on with my life and from then I painted like this perfect picture in my brain of me, my dad, my mum and my brother and we was all a happy family and we was going to live together forever and everything was just going to be perfect because this is my second shot at life, like I've been given this amazing chance to have a great life because my obvious, like to me obviously my life with my parents wasn't going to be amazing, it wasn't going to be good and these parents are going to make my life for me basically they're gonna be the making of me they're gonna set my life up for me and when I was about seven my dad had an affair and that was like the breaking of me that like crashed my picture and at that age I felt like my life sort of fell apart And, and from then, like, I developed, like, problems at school, like, I was a very, like, before, I was, like, a golden student, like, I was, like, a teacher's pet, and 
I would do everything and say everything I needed to but the moment that almost like my world came crashing down I was like almost like a terrorist <laughs> did your dad ever try to sit you down explain talk to you no so when whenever I so my dad went to live with his mum temporarily when it all happened and when I would get upset about it and when I'd cry about it my dad would turn around and call me stupid and tell me that I'm an idiot for being upset and it's stupid that I'm crying he's about at, it. He's looking at it from a man's point of view. Yeah. Not looking at his, his little girl. Yeah. And it's probably also uncomfortable for him so he's yeah, and it. Yeah, looking back at it now I think it was also a bit of guilt as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. Because how could you see your daughter in that kind of state at such a young age from something that you've done? Yeah, but like, in, 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 as a bloke, I can say certain things may not compute. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, well... And especially, we don't know what his father's like. Yeah. So cheating is part and parcel. It's like, part... It's... A royal family, for yeah. example. You always have a mistress, so what's the problem? Yeah. What's Diana got upset about? And his, my dad's dad did exactly the same thing. Exactly, you see? So, and how did he take it? Did he take it well? Or, or he just saw it as like... He disowned my mum. Wait a minute, your dad's dad... Yeah, my dad's man, dad disowned my... Dis yeah, disowned my mum. Because... From my perspective, it was almost as if she was now the problem. Oh, because she didn't put up with it? Yeah. Oh, I'm with you now. With yeah, because yeah, she, yeah. she... So my grandma put up with it and she stayed with my granddad. Yeah. And they lived there happily, not so happily ever after. But my mum didn't put up with it and told my dad to fuck off. <laughs> It's always an interesting one. When I was in my 20s, I was on the coach trip. We were yeah. going to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't a coach trip. We were driving, but we were in the Antibor on the coach. Yeah. But we had flown over there. So I was part of the study. But point being, I was talking to some ladies on the coach. Yeah. And what we said, what I said to them, I gave them a story. I said, imagine you're married. And you've been married, married for many years. You've got three or four kids with this person. And uh, your friends are his friends. His friends are your friends. His family is your family. Your family is his family. So it's kind of yeah. perfect. And he makes a mistake. He cheats on you. Would you leave him or make him sleep on the sofa for a month and give him a hard time? And, and still be able to walk with your head high because you kept it within the house so you don't have to tell all your friends and all that and hear their input and put up the embarrassment and all of that Yeah. and the older women who are in their 40s said well it depends did he cheat like again and again and does he love that woman? Is he still remembering my birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, all, all those kind of things, Valentine's? Mm. And is it all about us? Or is it the other woman? Is she trying to take our place? If she's trying to take our place, then obviously, and he's allowing that, then he's got to go. But yeah. if it's just like, then I'm going to punish him, but he's not going anywhere. So he's my man and we put in too much work. Yeah. And why am I going to go to somebody else who could just do the same 10 years down the line or whatever mm. do you understand yeah. now the younger ones nope he's gone yeah he's gone <laughs> that would that, that would be my answer <laughs> no yeah but I understand but it was interesting seeing the different analogy the different frame of mind depending on where they were in life because the older women were all in their 40s I was in yeah. my 20s at the time but I think, like, with my mum, she's struggled, like, since, you know, my dad did whatever and they've been separated, she's struggled with relationships because her first relationship after that, it was for six years, but 
the man didn't accept the fact that me and my brother were around because he had had his own children, his children were grown up and he didn't want to deal with yeah. someone else's children. So in the end, she left him because she said, if you're not going to accept my children, I'm not accepting you. Yeah. So she left him. Do you think that should have been something she should have sussed out from the start? Six years is a long, long time to waste. I mean, like, per I mean, I guess I'm biased because it's my mum and all I want is for my mum to be happy. But I think, like, if it brought her happiness in the given moment, then what is it? Like, if she was happy for six years, then that's great for her because, like, she was supposedly happily married for 20, 25 years and then my dad did what you know had an affair and completely broke her like from from such a young age i would be in bed and i would hear this noise and i'd go downstairs and i'd see my mum's you know laying on the floor having a breakdown like oh, is it? So it yeah really affected her, didn't it? yeah it really she never really saw affected it her yeah because it, some women don't think their their partner could ever cheat on them because they're very nice yeah no she she never ever saw it come in and to see from such a young age to see my mum like that like all i've wanted growing up and being older is for my mum to be happy that's all i've ever wished for so like seeing her you know in a relationship whether the man cares about me and my brother or not, I, n I never thought of that. That never crossed my mind. It was just all about, is my mum happy? And as long as my mum looked happy to me, then I was happy with what she was doing. But since then, like, growing up and getting more of an understanding about the world, about relationships, about everything, like, I've realised it's not just about the face that people show you. It's so much deeper than that. It's also good to understand why, why people are certain ways in life in general. Yeah. Because when you, when you understand why, you can have empathy for people. Yeah. When you have empathy for people, you're less. It's less harder. It's harder to get mad at somebody you have some empathy for. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? And then you can kind of work with them, regardless of their flaws and their faults. Yeah. Which I believe the older generation have, but the younger generation don't. I am completely the opposite on that. I think the younger generation have more empathy based on personal experiences, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, you, about your birth parents, do you, do you know them still? Do you get in touch with them? Yeah, so just before I turned 18, I turned around and I said to my parents, look, I've since such a young age, I've always wanted to know just where I come from and what my life could have been and have I got siblings and I had all these questions and just before I turned 18 I said to my parents look you've always told me when I was 18 I could know everything and anything I wanted to and it was like a few days before my 18th birthday and I said to them I want to know so they gave me my like yeah my folder and all my files and everything and I looked through it and obviously I got really emotional looking through all of it and I found out that I have six other siblings and more on my so six other siblings on my mum's side more on my dad's side but nobody really knows them and there was a letter at the back of all of the files and all of the documents and it was from my birth mum and it just like briefly it just stated like her name her address just a little bit about her and Did she write it yeah yeah it was handwritten and it was just basically a let letter to say like if you want to know me here i am and when i read that like i got really emotional and I started writing a letter and then it sort of went through my head like oh what if she doesn't live there anymore so I just kept thinking to myself like I, I wrote out the letter that I wanted to send and I just kept thinking oh like 
what if she isn't there anymore? So I kept thinking to myself, and I thought, because she's got such a uh, a unique name, I've never ever heard anyone with the surname before, and rarely any people with the first name. I thought to myself, let me look on Facebook. So that night at like 3 a.m., I looked on Facebook and I found her and I messaged her and then from there I've just sort of been building a relationship with her and both of my adoptive parents know that Um, and obviously I don't speak to my adoptive dad but I speak to my adoptive mum and she's really supportive of it. Do you feel that you need to build a bridge with your adoptive dad? Just no. For, just for closure. Even if you have a sit down, you say you say how you felt and what everything was, and if he doesn't want to take anything or go with anything, or even if you don't, at least you said that and you were at peace. Not I mean? necessarily to. Um, I guess yes, in a way, because I'm curious of like where I come from and why I'm wired the way I'm wired and why I am who I am. Because I know my birth mum, so it would be interesting to know my birth dad Mm -hmm. and to sort of get a picture of it all. Yeah. So, that's... Yeah, I see. I only say that because, for myself personally, there's certain things I had to address. My family is very big on my mum's side. My mum's one of 15, my dad was one of 10 on both oh. sides. And it's like, um, and that most people, I had other family members who were vast, like cousins with 22 children. So how wow. on earth you couldn't sort out looking after two adopted children while my old man was in jail and my mum had her own personal mental health issues. Yeah. And when I confronted my gran about it on my mum's side, my grandma, Mm. It was more of like, let's just hear what she has to say. And she didn't really have anything to say. And then, uh, at least that was it. Like, she's dead now. She died, what, a year or so ago. But I, I didn't feel, and I just felt disappointment. Yeah. That she couldn't be, do her job. Yeah. Um, And she does her job to some of the younger cousins, but it's like, yeah. you don't, you just have to accept things. But at least I had that kind of closure. Yeah. And that's why I, I mean, like, that. personally, when I first started to get to know my birth mum, like, everything was, like, a movie. Like, as you can imagine, it was amazing. And then, sort of a year along the line, I found out that she was lying about things and she wasn't giving me the complete truth. So then I was sort of filled with, like, disappointment. And I thought to myself, like, well, if you've lied about something this little, what else have you lied to me about? So I sort of, I spoke to my, like, siblings that I know and extended family, and then I found out a lot more that she'd lied about. So since then, I haven't... I'm still yet to speak to her and confront her about it, but personally, since the first time finding out yeah she's lied about this I thought to myself I'm never ever gonna get the truth so I've sort of accepted that myself just knowing I'm never gonna get it I'm never gonna really know why and what happened Hmm. I would say this as a mother if your children are taken away it's not like as a father if your if your ex partner runs off with your kids, it, it hurts as a father. But as a mother, if your kids are taken away from you, it's like a real. It's it's, it's it says something. Yeah. And, and why I say it like that is because. No, it's a bit like if a woman can't have children, she may not feel like a, a full woman. Yeah. And so. There's an element of probably a denial where your mum will lie or deceive, but in her mind, it's the truth now because she's in denial because yeah. she felt so bad. 
yeah and that not to justify it um, or or it's, it's for like a good cause yeah yeah but that's not just yeah what i'm saying is that not, doesn't justify her action yeah is wrong of is course, wrong yeah. and right is right but she she can kind of it's just just the way the human mind works when you you know you've done something you know it was really wrong and you actually sorry about it and then you kind of make a way to um yeah validate or give your own version of making yourself feel better yeah to like justify Mm -hmm. everything to yourself i have one last question for you Mm -hmm. you've been very patient on this journey (laughs) um (laughs) if you could improve the social services regarding how we are dealt with as children who are adopted and fostered and go through the system Mm. what would that be because i work in a nursery and i've had experiences with social services in nurseries not not really based on my own experience because I don't feel like... I feel like they did everything they could to help me mm-hmm. and my brother. But based on what I've seen, it would probably to be... to actually understand the situation before you do anything drastic or to really analyze the situation because from experiences of working in a nursery I've seen that nursery teacher not nursery teachers that social services are very quick to snap children out of parents hands for unjust reasons yeah. from my experience personally it they did everything and more they could but from what I've seen from like, as a working professional, they've done more than they should. Or, like, they've done too much. Mm-hmm. Would you... Mm, would you so, say, um, I'm ve- I, I don't know. Would you say that's partly the fear of if things go wrong? Yeah. Because obviously when things go wrong, somebody's front and centre, usually the social worker on the news, this child died and this person yeah. is to blame who works at such and such local authority. Yeah. And your face gets strewn across the news, across the country kind of thing. You're... But I, I think doing that job is so hard. Mm-hmm. It's such a hard job. Like, any action you take is right to 50% of people and wrong to 50% of people, you're never going to be completely right or completely wrong to anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. So I I don't really know. I thought about that. I asked you that question because I thought about it many times before. And what's your answer? I can't. can't, You know what the hard thing is? There's too many different kind of cases. Yeah. There's too many different kind of cases to have one system fits all. Yeah. You're dealing with people make mistakes. I've I've got children. I've made a mistake with my firstborn son. Um, and I would never make that mistake with the rest of my children. Yeah. Especially I was a young as a teenager. But when 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 you become a parent, you're not given a handbook on mm. how to be a parent. I think. For people who come from care, the hard for thing is is that if you haven't got... And I, I wouldn't even just say people come from care. If you don't have... When I lived in Africa, yeah, a lot of the social elements, problems that we have here, they don't necessarily have there. Because yeah. there's a big onus on family. Yeah. So if... Let's say I'm dating you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if we can be dating each other okay... If we want to move in together or anything of that, or you're going to be spending time in my house yeah. quite often and on a regular basis, I have to bring you to my family. Yeah. And then you have to bring me to your family and they will decide if they like us. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. And they'll do certain checks to see 
if you can do what women do, like the housework, if you're yeah. the face tidy, can I, am I educated, am I civil, am I likely to mistreat you, all these kind of things, and these yeah. are the things both families think, and then from then on, even though we're not married, their idea is that we're going to be getting married sooner or later, so that's yeah. how they see themselves, so if my mum can't get in touch with me, she will phone you and she expects you to know where I am, the yeah. same way if your father can't get in touch with you, He'll call you and expect him. Yeah. Now, to just to go a bit deeper on that, to why I'm telling you this story, is that mm -hmm. what I found, and this was across all the different tribes, because Africa, they deal with tribes, nationality, yeah. secondary, or third. Um, what, what you have is, if we're having a problem in our relationship, let's say I'm coming home late all the time, from Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, you're getting upset. So you can go into my... Um, uncles or my sisters and say this is the situation my sisters will explain to the men in my family and they will have a word with me and I'll say yeah but you know I can't I'm always with her blah, blah, blah. and they will sit me down and say listen you're married now yeah look after her you have to take her out at least once a week yeah some yeah. days are time for family it's not a time for your friends yeah. Saturday night, you may go out with her, or may go out with your friends, but you, you at least take her out one night to so choose what night that is, and you look after it and don't embarrass us. Yeah. Now, that is structure, it's order, and there's also a pressure for you not to embarrass your family. Yeah. Your family's everything. When you're sick, you're going to rely on them, all these kind of things. We don't really have that here. No, 100%. And because we don't have that here, we get a lot of social problems. And the English, unlike the Irish and the Scottish and the Welsh, they kind of see family as husband, wife, um, and she two children, and a cat and a dog, and a budgery guard. Yeah. They don't see it as an extended. So since yeah. I went to live back with my birth father's family, I was living with third cousins, fourth cousins, second cousins, but we never used that term second or third. It was just cousins. Yeah, it was your cousin. And like, for instance, when I was younger, I used to be in my grand's house. And there used to be like 20 cousins in the house. And they're all like, like five years old and younger at times. We used to look after them um, when we come from school. And they're all like my grand's, um, well, my uncle's and aunt's children. Mm. And they just drop them there. And they've obviously they're being brought up right because my grand's super looking out for them. And then they can go to work and do what they do. Yeah. Do you understand? And Sunday, everybody used to come around. The whole thing used to be like... 50 people plus every room you go yeah. into even the bathroom's got people in yeah and it used to be like that every sunday and that's when i really understood about how family is my own culture yeah and that different thing and i think that's very and valuable. how family is really meant to be yeah. and i see that as priceless and if you don't have that structure that i've told people this before and some people say no that's too many people in my business because when you want to separate if you want to separate from that person I have to tell my family why I want to separate. I have yeah. to tell your family. And your I, I can't tell them any half ass answer. I've got yeah. to give them a good justification. Yeah? yeah. So in the sense of like cheating, if, I, if, if you're saying you want to leave me or I want to leave you because there's been infidelity, they will say to you, okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to go and find another man. You've got some of the other man's kids. And then he may cheat on you. Yeah. And what are you going to do, move on again? Or are you going to try and sort out the problem? Because he's cheated on you, why? What was wrong? What's the thing? You need to address that. Yeah. And if you're going to address it, then it's worth fixing. So, and, and it's very, it was a very interesting experience. I spent five years in Africa, 10 years traveling around Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And when you see the cults, their very cultures are very similar. Yeah. Between the Asians, Africans, and the uh, Arabs, very very similar, but it works. Yeah, it works. It yeah, works. And regardless of you know, well, feminists might say it is, or other people may say <sighs> that. I, I just disregard that because I see that it works. Yeah. And I'm learning. It's it's hard. It's hard transition from Western culture to understanding thing, but once you get it, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So in like hope i was meant to do it last year but it never worked out because of covid but in two to three years i'm hoping to pack everything up 
and go travelling and I'm going to start in Southeast Asia and like my main reason for doing that is just because I fell in love with their culture Mm. I just fell in love with it it's so different to living here Mm. well thanks a lot it's been a great interview yeah, it has. Thank you very much. And we wish you well Thank you. on your endeavours in life. We hope you liked that interview. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to get the latest daily episode. Ever considered investing in the continent with the fastest growing economy and population on Earth? The same continent that holds 30% of the world's known natural resources? Then listen to our sister podcast, Africa Investor Stories, where you will hear real investors with real stories from around the world share their experience of investing in Africa. We post Monday and Thursday at 10am.